Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Jordan here with Art with Bill. If you are a sculptor, painter, or candlestick maker, this is the place you need to be. Why? Because collectors buy from people they know. And what better way for them to know you than the power of your story? In other words, telling is selling. And today we have a story all the way from Tennessee. A man is going to really tighten you up with his exciting experiences about his family, his art, and his career. We have Henry L. Jones. Hey, Henry, how are you doing today? Good morning, Bill. How you doing? All right, all right, all right. Come on, man. Give me a shout out. How you doing, Henry? I feel good. I've had all my right. coffee, so I'm hyped up. <laughs> all right. So, so Henry, you know, we were we were chatting early before we got interrupted by the powers of nature about your family, your uncle Henry, right? No, what uncle, was Chuck. uncle Chuck. Uncle Chuck. Yeah. Run it. You know. And the question I asked you was how you got into the arts, and you were saying that you were a very precocious young man. You can right. take things apart, like. Tell us about your, your grandmother and her sewing machine. Well, that was, yeah, my maternal grandmother. She, downstairs in the basement, they had some um, twin beds where my father and his brothers used to live. And um, when we would visit my grandmother, uh, my brother and I would, were down there. And they had some interesting rooms. And one day, I found this beautiful black sewing machine. And I started fiddling with it. And... I took it apart and she was crying and upset and couldn't figure out why, you know, she probably wondered why would this child just take my sewing machine apart? But I put it back together. I mean, she was upset and, but you know, I had just the pieces in, in my mind, well, this goes here, that goes there. And I, I put it back together. Um, how, how old were you then? Oh, let me see. I must've been, I, I was obviously a, a preteen, yeah, because it wasn't middle school or high school. It was pretty young. Yeah. 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 All right. So, 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 so you could, you could, you could take them down and put them back at the early age of under ten, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe about ten, about ten, eleven, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. And then, so then, how did that, how did that particular insight move you forward in your in your artistic career? Well, just. Um, working with my hands my other grandmother that was my fraternal grandmother we call her granny and that i took her sewing machine apart my fraternal my maternal grandmother uh was an artist herself she was a portrait artist so when we would visit her i spent most of my time just hanging out with her watching her paint she basically had um commission type things because someone asked me, did I ever go to an exhibit with her? And I've never, I don't remember her ever having an exhibit. I do remember people coming over, sitting, a few, um, and her painting pictures. I wanted to paint on those images that she was doing. <laughs> and, um, but I would just sit there and watch her. And I was just so fascinated. Um, she painted in oils. and. Um, that's every time I smell oil, I hope it's like that. I get transported back to those days, those summers. Right. Of, uh, watching her. And, um, and, and that happens a lot, you know, well, for me, certain smells, images, sounds just trigger memories. And like, I'm right back. I'm right back. Yeah. Well, what, 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 that ties into your uncle, the, the, the carpenter guy. What was his name? Uh, <laughs> uncle Chuck. Yeah. When uncle I, Chuck. when I bump gas. Tell, tell us about Uncle Chuck. Tell us about Uncle Chuck, man. What's yeah, he, he, he had all little projects and things. We would go over to the house and uh, he'd be in his garage just working on things. It might be the car, it might be fixing things. And he'd just be sitting out there. And I love to just hang out with him. And um, I said, I talked about earlier, I remember once when he cut his finger and blood just gushed all over and and the, the, the um, rag that he grabbed, it was very dirty, but he's like, hold it, hold it. So I'm holding on to his finger and blood's gushing out. And he reached over and got picked up a gas can. And uh, he's got the shakes. So he's then pouring, and then he's had me take that rag off. And then he's pouring gasoline on his finger. Now, I do remember Uncle Chuck using gasoline to clean different car parts and other things. But when I saw that, it, I saw that several other times when he got hurt gasoline. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I knew that quite, that wasn't something you should be pouring on your skin. Right, right. 
I guess it that- told me that uh, back in the day, people did that, you know, because it was a disinfectant. So, and I guess it's better than nothing. But. Well, yes, it, it is a disinfectant, but I imagine it must have been kind of painful as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So, so now you also mentioned that that when you were in school, you uh, you wanted to be a biology major. I was a biology major. Yeah, I got oh. a degree in biology. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I, and, I, I could you share with us your 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 preparation techniques with respect to the sketching and stuff like that? Um, drawing, um, illustrating the the tissues, the bones, all the different biological systems, so that I knew I had a thorough understanding of those systems because when you take tests most of the time they give us they'd um position that you would you know paper test but sometimes there'd be a microscope and various slides and they'd ask you to look under in the uh, microscope identify that tissue talk about and then sometimes in that on that slide with a little picture there'll be an arrow so you look in that microscope bill and they'll say identify that tissue and once you identify that tissue, they, the next question on the test may be something like, uh, identify the structure of that tissue and what is its function? And it'll be a series. So in other words, you look in that microscope and you cannot identify the tissue. There is no way you can identify and talk about a structure within the tissue. Right, right, right. So you really had to have a thorough understanding of the big picture and then those internal worlds and how they correspond to our body and so forth. Because other questions kind of rolled off of that, you know. And what, what school did you attend? What university? Fisk, Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, all right. You stayed in state. Yes. And now, how did that, your, your, biology background, how did that translate over into your art or, or does it? it? It does. I have um, some images and it's subconscious because, um, I mean, I do create paintings where I'll do a cartoon, but for the most part, most of my paintings, Bill, I will start with that blank canvas and position um, different colors around the side. I have an image in my mind and then I will begin to move all those colors onto the canvas, and I paint mainly with my hands. That's the other thing. Oh, you do? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, um, that happened almost by accident because I, when I, I lived in Chicago, and in my apartment I had basically no furniture. You know, I had a girlfriend. She's like, "Where's your furniture?" I said, "I don't need furniture. Just need a <laughs> kitchen." You know, because in the sunroom and the living room I had my artwork in a corner of that room I just had a chair that I found in the alley I didn't have an easel I found a wooden chair had a broken leg I repaired it I put a stick in the back of it and to, to lengthen the support and that was my easel okay so the smaller pieces I used that and then I had the other paintings on the floor so I'd be down there painting and one day I couldn't get to a brush and I was working fast because I was just in the zone and I reached over to get this paint and my hand fell in it and then I, it's dripping paint and I was like, oh, that, that kind of feels good. I like that. <laughs> I went into the paint and all of a sudden that day I was like a little child, a little elementary school child yeah. and I was painting with my hands and I fell in love with me the texture the viscosity of that paint now of course paint is not something you really want to be putting your fingers into you know it can be toxic especially if you have a cut um but i began to approach my art entirely different and i i just fell in love with that and then i i just started doing it. i still have brushes i use brushes but i just it, it's like when something clicks and you know right. you and you just do it, and that's that's when it started. And um, well, take take me back. I mean, you're doing the finger painting on the yeah. floor. Your girlfriend doesn't like that. You found the chair in the alley. Yeah. But how did you get a? You went to Fisk. And how did you get from Fisk to Detroit? I mean, how did that happen? Well, I grew up in Detroit. I went to high school partially in Detroit, then um, moved to Dallas, 
because um, there was a magnet school system in Dallas for students. It was the early days of the magnet schools. And um, in Detroit, it was either engineering, robotics, and then I had, I love science. And then it kind of fed the science or medicine. And of course, you know, you're a young child about to um, enter high school. And, you know, they ask kids, young man, what do you want to do in life? Be a doctor. Oh, yeah, there you go. There, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that, and um, so hearing that, seeing the smiles as a young person, and then in my mind saying, well, if I become a doctor, I won't feel any pain because people won't die. Um, it was only later. So I went on the fist, majored into, um, majored in biology pre-med, pre and um, actually did not enter art yet. Went on to graduate school and um, applied for medical school and because I missed that, that, that window to apply. And um, I took the test to get into medical school to apply and um, then got accepted some schools in graduate school, majored in human physiology, okay. another bizarre thing, but, um, but then got into a research opportunity and got a scholarship and man, I met a neighbor that was, I found that was an art major. He did these beautiful life-size caricatures. And um, we were talking and in the hallway and that he invited me into his place. And I saw and I said, man, you're an artist. He said, oh yeah, I'm an art major and I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And he said, what are you studying? He said, oh, I'm on the sciences. I go to the lab, I go to class, I study. I go to, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Poor, yeah. poor baby. All I do is go yeah, to school. Right. I mean, literally, literally, because there's just so much reading. I thought in undergrad, yeah, but when I got to grad, I was like, oh my God. You know, you think you love something, but when you get too much of it, you're like, oh, I don't love it that much. <laughs> right, right. Because I was tired. And anyway, one day I invited him into my home, my apartment, and I had a desk and a chair and a little bookshelf with all my science books. And that was my little station. But around the rest of my apartment, Bill, I had paintings. Oh. In that intensity of the sciences and getting into all the structures and concepts and functions of things, and all, which I did enjoy. I really did. I really did. Um, I would then venture off to the other side and paint. That was the way I kind of released. I always use painting as that balance to keep me focused. Um, not much of a drinker, not, not in the weed, and, you know. I mean, I, I enjoy myself, but I don't use any other thing. That was the way I kind of got my mind and head right by creating art. And he looked around and said, Jones, I thought you were a science major. And I was like, I am. He said, wow. well, what is all this? And then he said something to me, Bill, that I still remember and, and kind of echo. He said, you're an artist because you got all this, all this is it, and you got this little area of a science. He said, because what we, <laughs> put in, yeah, what we put in our homes is what's in our heads. Right. And he told me, he said, you, he asked me, have you shown this to people? And I told him the story growing up, you know. He said, no, you need to show this to somebody because you might want to change your major or something because you're an artist. He said, you're doing a lot of art. <laughs> and um, I showed it to a gallery um, person, the dealer in Nashville that my roommate in undergrad was working for one summer. Uh -huh. And he took me under, it was in the gallery, Carlton Wilkerson, and he took me under my wing, under his wing. And the time that um, I brought work there, I met a um, an art professor from Penn Penn State, at least you yeah know, Penn State, but she was more of a mentor. Now, I really didn't see that many abstract painters, and she had these beautiful, huge abstract paintings that I just it felt like I was falling into the piece visually uh -huh. and, and spiritually, and I and 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 oh my dear, so I said, wow. But I began to understand what it's meant to be an artist in terms of just letting it all out. 
And then I went crazy, as a cousin told me, because sure. in the research, I got accepted to five, four or five medical schools. I got in there, another re I got into a research program dealing in botany. That was like my set in love. I love being outside working with plants. Uh -huh. They were going to pay my tuition every summer, go there, because I did an internship with them with the USDA Forestry Service. Okay. And they said, look, we'll pay your tuition. You got to change your major. Um, and we're going to pay you a stipend while you're in school, Bill. And every summer you come out to Missoula, Montana, which is where I went the first time. and um, We'll pay you to continue because I was dealing with research, collecting specimens, having a ball, actually. And uh, after graduation, you'll have a job. And, I, and, and when I told my, my parents that, they were like, wow, yeah, that's great. Which one do you want to do? You yeah. know? And I thought about it, and I announced I wanted to be an artist. And a lot of people thought I went crazy because they said, Okay, you've loved science all your life. You talked about being a doctor. You talked about this. And now you want to give this up and be an artist. So let's, 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 let, let me jump in on that because this is something that, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before and you're just a living testimony of that. How would you be an artist? You're going to starve, right? Exactly. That, that, yeah, I've heard that many times. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, like, you got a lot of pushback from your family. Yeah, what, what propelled you to stay and make that, that transition? Well, there were, at first it was that feeling where I felt like I must do this because when a lot of the things I paint about are things that have happened, personal events and things. So well, let's, 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 let's just jump into one of these images right now. Maybe you can give us... Okay. The insight. Oh, before we go too far, folks, this show is presented to you courtesy of the Core 80. If you're an artist, a sculptor, or candlestick maker, go there for your composition skills. Great stuff, guy. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, you know, take your art from where it is now to like 10 years ahead in a very short period of time. Anyway, this is one of your images. What's the what's this one called? This piece is titled King Without a Crown. It's um, a, a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, and you were, we, were, we were talking about how the art, the things you paint are from your life. And is this one of those pieces? This is connected because the story behind this piece, Bill, is that um, I had exhibited at um, Vanderbilt University at their Black Cultural Center. and that show, it was, it was well, it was well received, good turnout and everything. And this woman contacted me and said, oh, have you ever exhibited at Scared Bennett? And I'd heard of Scared Bennett, it's right across the street from Vanderbilt. In fact, it used to be part of Vanderbilt's campus and then it branched off into its own institute. Anyway, um, did the interview thing and looked at the space. It's a huge, beautiful space. In fact, it is the largest space that I have exhibited in a solo show. Okay. Um, so I said, yeah, this, this is great. And they were doing renovation and so forth. And she told me that. And I was just, I was just loving the amount of space. It was huge. And she said then that the show would run for three months. That has never happened. Usually, what, six weeks, a month but never three months. And she said, oh, I need to come up with a thing. And I said, oh, and she told me the months, January, February, and March. And I said, I, I, got, I got a thing, freedom. January, King, Civil Rights Movement. February, Black History Month, that whole fight. March, Women's Month. Okay. I already had some pieces related to those things, but I need to create more. I had time to. Well. I went home excited and um, also, no, I've never shown a piece of sculpture as being an artist. I've created sculpture. Now, where were you living now? I'm living in Nashville. That was in Nashville. Oh, Nashville. Okay. Yes. And um, so she told me also I could sh um, bring a piece of sculpture in because it it's a huge piece of um, wonderful space. Um, then I, I went home 
And as an artist, I've said, I don't need to make a sketch painting any rendition of Martin Luther King. And that's because I've seen some wonderful sketches already of artists who have done that. And, I, I, and for me, I just thought it was a little bit redundant. You know, right, I'm right. Singing the same song as someone else. You yeah. know, there Luther Vandross, why do I need to sing his song? Um, so when I got home, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Martin Luther King, I need to paint something in dedication to Martin Luther King. And the first thing that popped in my mind is what the exhibits I've seen at Jordan King, when artists would basically paint a portrait of Martin Luther King. And it bothered me because I didn't want to paint or sketch anything of Martin Luther King. So I said, well, based on what I create, you know, I'm feeling around, what can I create that would be inclusive of King, the Freedom March, and also connected to history. And this piece, King Without a Crown, actually came from that. Because, um, and it happened at night where I thought about that. I said, because Martin Luther King was not just thrown into this, this, this bowl of a vacuum. He, is, he was part of a long lineage of freedom fighters from the past. Right. Yeah, most a lot of people a lot of people don't recognize that. Let yes. me let me, right. let me ask you a question now. You're living in, in, in Memphis now, right? Nashville. You're in Nashville where this happens. Right. And and now like I'm gonna change topics a little bit. Okay. I just wanna know, like, you know, I wanna know about your main squeeze. When did you find your main squeeze, man? How did that happen? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That was in Chicago. That's Car curveball. <laughs> yeah, because I went to Chicago for one reason, and um, after graduate school, basically followed someone there, and um, that didn't work out. I mean, that young lady, some people just aren't right for each other. And uh, I was actually ready to leave Chicago, go back to Detroit, and continue on with everything, and. Carlton Wilkes, my dealer at the time, he said, what do, you, what do you mean leave Chicago? You are in one of these cities. If you're an artist, you need to stay in Chicago and, and try to do something. And um, then I began to connect more with the art world because, you know, sometimes, well, for me, I broke up with that relationship and I said, well, I'm just going to work myself. So I worked at a hospital um, in the tech part because I use all my research skills. Because in graduate schools, Bill, I used to cut open rats as part of our study. Okay. And I administered drugs and all these wonderful barbaric type things. But later, it, it, they computerized with simulations. Because um, I'm an animal lover, and, and you know, I'd seen that in, in um, undergrad and, and a little bit in high school. But those animals were in jars, you know. Mm. But we had to kill the rats and then this little head thing that I'd never seen. I'm like, oh, okay, so cute little furry rat <laughs> and I have to kill him or it's like you, you um, basically um, you would, it was a device that uh, made him a quad, quadriplegic. Okay. And I, I thought it was pretty, but I was part of the class and I went with it. So um, with that relationship, it didn't work out. Um, I made the decision to stay in Chicago, make the means of it. And that's when I fell in love with Chicago. I, my first cultural love was at Fisk, when I saw so much. Met some um, professors that were artists and the, 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 the art that was there, the rich right. culture. And the second was when I was in Chicago. Because there, you know, it was work trying to get things. And... I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I really did not know how to become an artist. You know what I mean? Uh, when, when did you discover that? Well, um, picture this. Graduate school with the beautiful young lady, nice. Um, thinking possibly marriage, it wouldn't have worked. Um, and we followed each other. I didn't want to go through a long distance relationship. They don't work. And um, so moved to Chicago, had to get a job. And, you know, we're living together and all that, which wasn't quite the right thing to do, thinking back. But um, 
the job I had in the hospital, I was more of a treadmill, reminiscent of graduate school where uh, work nights, worked all night, and woke up a few more hours, it was time to go back to work. Mm -hmm. I was very tired. Now, I made the decision to become an artist, but here I was working, working, working. And um, the, there was a big transition for me where once I was at the post office and I had my portfolio, I was to meet somebody because I did look out for exhibits and things. And there was a woman at the post office said, oh, you looked at my black case and said, are you an artist? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. And she said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to a meeting and show somebody some of my art because I didn't, you know, back then you didn't have a handheld anything. Either you had slides or yeah, pictures. You had, you had to take everything with. Yes. And I couldn't afford pictures. I didn't have slides. So I would always carry my portfolio in case I, you know, when I had an interview or in case I ran into somebody. Uh, I, I did have a few shows. Um, but she told me, she introduced me to her husband. We're in this long line. And he seemed a little bit off, like, you know, mentally disconnected. And she, she asked me, how many hours do I actually paint per day? And I explained, well, not much. Because I wasn't. I was working constantly. And on my off days, I basically was trying to catch up. Um, and I am a night person, but that, it was really frustrating and tiring. Broke up, and then that's what I was doing. And she said, you know, my husband here, he was a postman. He was a plumber. She listed all these jobs he did all his life, and he painted just a little bit. And he said when he retired, he would be an artist. And along the way, now he got, he retired, and old age, sickness, so he was going through all these things and he never really painted. But he saw younger artists that copied his style. Okay. And when she said that, that's what her husband said. Yeah, they still in everything. They still in my style. I had to, I painted that way first. And he was, that's when he really became explosive. And she said, you hear that? You need to devote eight hours a day. You need to whoop your butt and paint like people do for nine to five because do you think if you painted every day at least eight hours you create a lot of our city so, so so let me ask you this yes when did you find the main squeeze that was later that was later actually in the hospital yeah okay I, I, could, yeah. Come, could you want to could you share a few juicy tidbits about that juicy tidbits or just, or, or just interactive. I said, I'm not going to, I'm just going to work. And then this beautiful woman walked in. And I said, whoa. <laughs> and, and I actually, um, I was actually writing for a publication at the time, um, freelance. I did some freelance writing. And um, I had an assignment. And I asked her out for a date. Had an assignment. The Archibald Motley. And I, um, I had heard of Archibald Motley when I was at Fisk, and I think I saw some of his beautiful portraits in um, a book. And there it was, a solo exhibit that came to Chicago. And the, the publication that I worked for it said, oh, I want you to write about Archibald Motley. And I said, oh. And it was on the day that I'd asked my now wife, Jeanette, on a date. Okay. So I took her to the Archibald Motley <laughs> exhibit <laughs> because... And as I was talking, this is our, yeah, our first day. Um, as we were talking, I was jotting things down, and she kept, what, what are you doing? You know, because of course this is a date. You're supposed to be focused on the young lady, right? right. But but you're an artist, so you're focusing on the art. And the art, and and jotting down notes from an article, and then eventually I told her uh, what I um, was writing. So she initially knew me as a writer. And because um, hadn't been to my place and so forth, and later um, as an artist. And okay, I, so let's 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 move along. And you have three three children, right? Yes. Oh, you're blessed. You're blessed. Okay. The next, what can you tell us about this particular image here? This piece is actually a detail from 
um, a painting called We See, I Am the Eyes. Okay. It's a zoom in because um, the whole, the, the, there's another slide we'll probably get to. This, this painting focuses on the voyeuristic um, world because we, in a, we live in a society that is primarily video centric. That's why we have so many love of television, and especially now reality shows. When um, back when the writers went on strike all over in Hollywood and so forth, that's when reality shows took off, and um, it's it's really kind of spun into a series of all these types of reality shows, and um, and that's because the writers were on strike, and those companies needed to do something to put something on the air. So what, what's, what, what's the main story in this piece? What are you trying to get across? Two things. One, as a black person, it is that, that feeling when we walk into a store that not just the webcams, security cams that are around, that are watching, but already there's this unfortunate belief that you're a criminal and you're in there to shoplift. So they watch you. So well, now, 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 Henry, now that, now that can't be true, man. Oh, no. Maybe it's just the things I'm wearing, and they're like, what? That guy's got some odd clothing on. But you know, I, I, I play games when they, they watch me, Bill. Um, because what, do you, what, do you, how, how, what games do you play with them? Well, if they're watching me and I know it, it first it makes me upset most of the time because um, you're in a store, especially one you're not familiar with, and you're looking for something. Instead of that person watching you, believing you're about to shoplift, perhaps they need to come up and ask you, um, you need some help and help you. But I'll play a game where I might walk to the end of the aisle and peek around in almost a childlike way, pick something up, put it down, because I want to see what it is they think I'm going to steal. It might be something so large that there is no way I could actually shoplift that <laughs> item. You know, because I'm like, you know, it's, it's like, why would you just assume? But I, I understand why. There's the history of things. You know, we're seeing okay, as... So, so yeah. you have, this piece has two dimensions. It has, yes. it has the personal uh, aspect of being targeted in the store. And it has the other aspect of explaining how the society as a whole is more, uh, I guess, video oriented. Yes. And, and, and the, to the point where now with some of these shows, a person's misfortune becomes entertainment. Yes, this is true, and that and that I, I find that sort of uh, not really. Uh, I don't. I don't really like that myself. I, no, no, do I? No, do I? No, do I? I want to hear some stories of what you've been through and how you've you overcome those things. You know, we need more inspirational stories. And so, so, so this piece is a piece that just tells that particular aspect of it. What about this piece? What, what is that sharing? That is the full picture of We See, I Am the Eyes. And oh, okay. All right. Perspective. See, there's... Um, oh, I see it now. Yes, I uh, see. That mid-right right there, the, the previous detail. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. This is almost like, like an amoeba. Oh, I forgot you're a scientist, aren't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so now this, this is the, 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 the molecule with all its appendages and all its... It's, it's components. I see how, now I see what you're doing. Okay. And you're putting the face in there as, as one of the members of the, the right. thing. All right. It has nice energy to it, like a sweeping yeah. to bottom up, and then it sort of like floats at the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice very fun to do, too. And then what's the name of this piece again? Uh, we see I am the eyes. Okay, I see. Okay. Because it goes too far. I see how you're looking at me, but that's part of our, it's like we're supposed to, they're told you need to look out for these people, you know, because what they see is actually a false image. It's not something that actually happened. It's a, it's a projected image, a prejudice of what they believe is about to happen versus in our society, uh, innocent until proven guilty. Well, that's 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 a, that's a talk another time. But right, right. I I see what you're saying. Let's let's try another one. So we got here. What's this about? This piece is titled Mercutio, and um, this is part of a triptych. 
Okay. And I focus just on the first one, on this, um, this first one, because when I moved to Chicago, I visited Chicago way back, early, mid 80s. And I was just there, I, I flew in for a wedding, flew out. Didn't get to see the city that much. And when I decided to move to Chicago, came in by car, all my stuff, and passed by State Street. And along State Street, um, as my friend said, man, oh, slow down. I didn't know what I was looking at. In Detroit, we have high rises of um, government housing, uh, the projects. Um, but along State Street were the series of the largest high rises I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And there was this, instead of grass in the front, you had cement pavement everywhere. Right, right. Trash. And what it reminded me was of a prison yard. And the fence was there. And I asked him to pull over and I just leaned against that fence, Bill, and looked. And was taken in. And I looked to my left and I looked to my right and saw block after block after block of this. Mm. And later, I realized when I uh, learned the layout of Chicago and different places where things were, I saw how purposely these series of buildings were in this area. Yes. Well, this painting was actually, well, yeah, this, this was the first painting that I did after I got all settled and Mercutio. And here what I've illustrated was the silhouettes the rectangulars that you see within the blue and some of that um, that um, type taupe color. Yes. Those I'm using to illustrate all the scream. I mean, it was just this insane. Some windows, you could see people just in their windows. Serene. Some people were screaming. Mm. People were shot. And I, and I oh. had never seen my right. people in such chaos. But then if you put people in a setting that resembles a prison yard and later i actually worked with an organization and was able to go inside some of those buildings to see the conditions and it broke my heart from what i smelled what i saw the conditions and the city wasn't doing much about it okay we want to renovate it and so how does how does this how does how does your work go towards telling that story up at the upper um left Many of my pieces, I have this ancestral figure. Okay. They always feel there's a round influence, oh. this connection. So are you, are you saying that you, that, that you tap into the, to the spirit world? Exactly. The spiritual realm. Yeah. How does that, how does that, how do you do that? How does that feel? It, it feels like being in a trance. Um, where even the room I'm in seems to fade away. I'm in an entirely different place. And the images and things are coming to me. Because when I see that type of fence, that type of uh, metal um, steel type uh, galvanized fencing, it's almost I'm back to that very day, that first day, going down State Street. And I touched that galvanized fence, so I'm back right there looking at the housing again. So that's when I mean, we, certain things will trigger that. Okay. So that's, that's, you know, you know, that's something that I think people experience that sensation yet. Deja vu or whatever you might want. Well, people are reluctant or unable to articulate that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, so let's, let's go on to the next one here. What's this about? This is titled Freedom Run. And um, this was somewhat of a tribute. Uh, I've, I've created several paintings um, dedicated to Harriet Tubman. Because, you know, when I love history. And when I would read about different historical figures, I'd wonder, well, did that person, okay, person had a wife, 
kids, where are the descendants of these? Because it's like, I would love to meet the descendants of like Frederick Douglass. There was um, an artist, I mean, uh, an actor, he told me what he was doing. He said, oh, I'm doing this uh, piece and I'm Frederick Douglass. I was like, really? And he got a chance to meet one of the descendants of Frederick Douglass. And I told him, I said, man, I, Jamal, I've always wondered about the descendants of all these historical figures. Well, apparently Harriet Tubman was, didn't have kids, uh, but influenced and saved a lot of people and their children, of course, by getting them into freedom. This one, though, Freedom Run, is once again, I was just delving into the whole concept of getting away. Well, you know, I, when I look at this piece, I, I automatically, I, I, I go back to your, to your biology. I, really? I see a, some type of biology creature in the middle of the thing with the tentacles in it. Oh, yeah. And that's actually this ethereal, um, sp that's, that's the ancestral figure because oh, okay. this uh, always floating, always near. And in the spirit world, I don't think, you know, we're going to see someone that looks concrete like we are, you know. Oh, right, right. I, I agree. And, and so I'm, they're, kind of, they're going to be kind of blended into these whatever dimensions that we don't understand. And um, even, even that, um, at times I think, you know, you, you can't put your finger on things. But um, when my father died, he was a cigar smoker. No one smokes in my house, Bill. Okay. And there have been moments where I walked in my house and smelled that brand <laughs> of my father's cigar. Okay, so now, you know, I, I want to jump in here with that. Okay. And, you know, what you're talking about is what I consider the real art. That is, there's a connection between you the vessel and the spirit and the spirit comes to you and you, you know, try to give out what the spirit's telling you. Uh, something like back in the old days, back in the continent, back in the primitive, primitive art societies. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable because today, you know, we don't have those kind of conversations. We have, no. well, you know, it was a nice purple. It was a chartreuse this. It was right. A, right. Yeah. You know, but it, you've missed the whole purpose of, of your call. Hmm. What's, what's, your, what's your view on that? I agree with that wholeheartedly because um, I think an artist should share a piece of him or herself and how they made a connection in something. De There's nothing wrong with decorative art, but even when I began to study the whole understanding of African art, I learned that even in the textiles, there were stories. So everything had a significance, had a spiritual connection. So of yeah. course, that really just excited me because I said, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm that, that spiritual connection. Right. So, and so that, that, that you have to pull something out of you in order to have something to share. Well, for, okay, how do you... In a copy machine. Well, how do you establish your con the connection with, with the... The, the spirit how do you i mean do you have a process do you, yeah. do you what do you do yeah. um and, and it was only because someone else asked that i had to begin to think about it there i like i have music playing i have incense burning and then most pieces if i see a rock or um, there's a picture or something, I have that item because that item is a concrete um, object that I can then touch and then begin to fall into where I'm supposed to go. And what do you mean? You, you touch the rock and then it grounds you between the spirit and the, and the physical? Well, okay. Um, I don't have that rock here. I found the... I, Told you I love walking in the nature and so forth. Yes, yeah. right, yeah. There was a stone I found that it actually looked like a dinosaur. I was excited, but it wasn't. It was just regular uh, river rock. But in that stone, on the top of it, was this intricate pattern of, um, it's like it was etched in. 
and I looked at it, and there it was, Bill. It looked like an embryo. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. It's a, it's a gray oval piece about the size of a stone that's about the size of a football. Mm -hmm. And there was this image that looked like an embryo. Wow. But nature did this. Nature did this. Maybe through uh, currents of water and sand and whatever other rocks hitting that rock and or who knows. But I saw that image. Now, it's possible to see images in practically anything in the world. You hear people saying, oh, I spilled coffee on my my rag. Right, right, right. right. So, so and so, you know. <laughs> or, but, but, but what I'm, gonna, what I'm asking you is this. It's like, I'm asking you to go a little deeper with the explanation. You know, you as a craftsperson, you as the bridge between the unseen and the seen, what is your process? You have the incense, uh, you have the stone. Thank you. Well, if it's a stone, it, it has to literally be some type of object. Okay, so, so, so you, let's say you're going to, okay, this piece right here, what was your, your, your tools you used to make that transition? What, what did you use? That piece there, what I remember more so about this piece, it was a windy day and I was being pushed through the wind. Mm. And it was in Nashville, and we have these winds that come, these, these gusts. And, you know, if you're a child, you can easily be pushed away. I'm, I'm six feet, kind of, you know, I put on weight. But that wind pushed me down. And um, not, not where I hit the ground, but it really threw me. And I thought about that whole concept, and I don't know where that inspiration comes from. Later that evening, I thought about the whole nature of running. I am a runner. When, okay. in, uh, when I was at Fist, I was a long distance runner. So I enjoy running. And try to imagine, like your home today, Bill, someone comes to the door and says, Bill, we got to get out of here. Let's go now. Grab your bag. Let's go. We're getting away. In other words, we're running to freedom. And there you are running. And it's running for your life because if you stop, they could find you. And so when I'm running, there's that second wind and all that. So I associated even that gust of wind with running. Okay. And none of us are slaves like in the past, different type of slavery. But this piece then stimulated that whole run. And that's why I called it Freedom Run because oh. we can imagine constantly running knowing that if you stop for a moment, they will find you, but you must keep running until you find that haven, that place of freedom where you can be safe. In right. fact, if you were born and raised on a plantation, you don't know where you're running to, but you know you're running away from where you were. And well, who is this person? That's a, that's a great metaphor for life in general. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You don't know where you're running, but you got to get out of You got to keep running. And, and you got to keep running because you know you don't want to be where you were. That's right. Let's go on to another piece here. Okay. What about this one? Ah, uh, we fly born free. And this is associated, um, this was painted later, still dealing with um, that concept of freedom. There's that tree of life that, or that family tree. And... And typically in a family tree, we're told of who was married, the, the offspring and so on, and the various siblings and those siblings married and their kids and so on and so on. And I envision this starting out where you have these roots. You always hear about the roots, where the roots, though, are connected to this lone lineage of people that were fighting for freedom. And then they, they knew that regardless of the condition, of that tree, they had to keep reaching for freedom. They had to keep seeking freedom. And here, above that tree, the tree to the lower, that black tree, and it's not so much racial, but it's more so about the death. Because there's a lot of death, even with the uh, Middle Passage, three-fourths that were captured and all were killed. You know, and then when they got to the, the Caribbeans, more died. So a small percentage 
actually survive. Well, what also, it's, 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 what I'm getting is it's 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 uh, this what you're saying is current today because it's yes. just a metaphor for this for life in general. We always have to keep hustling. Yes. Where you yes. can't stand still, you can't rely. No, yeah. You have you have energy energy to draw on, but you got to keep moving. Yeah, you you do have to keep moving. Um, and it's a, I, I think it's a lot harder now. We have more, we should be able to do more, but we're not. You, you ever read these stories about um, African-Americans right out of slavery? <laughs> and then they, had, they became millionaires. I mean, when you speak of being a millionaire back then, that, that's probably equivalent to being a billionaire today. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's a, the untold stories. And yeah. That's the reason why we have this show, because we want people to know your story, you can stand out, you can just go ahead and take care of business. You know? yeah. that, that's a good reminder that there were people who came out of slavery and using this as a metaphor, that people who come out of slavery today and become millionaires as well. Yes, I think it's possible. Yeah. What's this one here about? This one is um, to dance without heartache, hmm. cry die. It connected me, um, I saw in, um, a television program, and I think it was National Geographic way back, where they showed in an African village this ceremony called a cry die. And they explained that when someone died, there would be this huge celebration, this jovialness. And as they dance, it was an invitation for the ancestors to join them. Oh. That bridge was being made between the loved one that was there has transitioned to be welcomed by the ancestors. So it's more of a reunion, that whole cry die concept. Well, so let's, let's, let's tie in on that. Let's weigh in on that for a sec. In our culture, in this present culture, the, the, the notion of making the transition from the physical to the non-physical mm -hmm. is met with terror. Right, right. And that's the way I reacted to it as a young child. And somewhat even as an, an adult, I mean, yeah. So, so like in this piece, are, are you trying to change that, that concept or how are you? Well, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Because when we speak about connecting to our culture, our heritage, um, it's typically where we came from. You even have commercials, they tell you, oh, log in. Put your name, we'll tell you what percentage this, what percentage that. But with, as Africans in America, there's, there are remnants of our culture still within us. These innate things and, 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 and through music and, and so forth. But there are rituals and, and practices that still exist that I believe we could connect to. And and make us a different person because some why, of the things why, why is that important to connect to these rituals oh i think it's important because um well number one look at look at from a timeline america as a country is relatively uh, well not relative it's one of the youngest countries in the world there are societies civilizations that are thousands of years old and they've done all kind of things just to say i know i'm black I, I'm from Africa. I relate to these colors and, and things, and I know I know the geography is not enough. I think we have to have a deeper understanding, something of substance, where we understand why certain things were done. Because people weren't. Because if you look at Hollywood and the the portrayal of Hollywood of Africans, you're not going to get it. You well, know, no, that's, not, that's, that's, not a, that's not a good knowledge base. That's, that's, that's <laughs> definitely not. I, 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 and so forth. I mean, come on. I wouldn't, you know? I wouldn't recommend but, that. Yeah, and, and, piece, but that's but, the way some of us think Africa is. And uh, I've never been there. I've been uh -huh. to some Caribbean nations. But I've absorbed and I, I question up and talk to everyone I know. Oh, you from so-and-so, Ghana. You from Senegal. Oh, you know, what's it like? And where'd you grow up? Because I want to hear their stories. Because there's... You know, there, there are different things that people do and I love to taste the foods of those nations, too. And then how, did, how does this piece, you know, tie into that? The cry die um, for me is speaking of reconnecting with our ancestors, 
okay. reconnecting with that spiritual element, that spiritual realm, because I don't think it, it has separate, that's been separated. I think that's a-, a Well, let me ask you this. What, what, what's your spiritual practice? It's painting your spiritual practice? I, I would actually say that because some things I don't see a fit. And I always equate things to food because I say, you know what, when you taste something, you know what you like, you know what your tongue gets excited about, you know what your tongue doesn't. And any form of spirituality is to transform you and make you a better person, to give you a connection. Okay. Opinion, but um, so I, I, I agree with you. I, I never thought of phrasing it that word, that way, but I, I probably would do that. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to become, I'm trying to connect as, as much as possible of that which has been taken from me historically. Okay. That's the same piece, right? Right. This is just a detail of the cry die, the dance without heart. Well, there we go. We went through the images. And we're talking with Henry L. Jones. He's a painter, a sculptor. And you're also a writer. What's the name of this book here? You published the Run Into Blackness. Blackness. Run Into Blackness, yes. Oh, okay, I guess that blackness, I didn't get the whole image. And what, what is that about? That's a book of poetry um, that I published back in uh, 2010 through Numa Publishing International. And um, that started from <laughs> that book. I used to host open mic poetry in Chicago and this guy, and I, you know, I always talk about the whole visual thing. Oh, don't stop yourself and find a way to create. And this guy came in, Bill, had a chapbook, folded book, similar to a church program, a lot of inner pages. And um, he was up at the mic and he said, he explained that he had his, he, he, he had a little bit of money. He went to a um, thrift store, bought an old typewriter, and he typed and retyped each page, and then he went to a print place and had those pages reproduced. But he always wanted a book. And now, in my home, I had a computer. Okay. I had a printer. I doing freelance writing. I had, you know, uh, new desktop publishing. Did I have a book out? No. Did yeah. I have a book? Yes. And I looked at him and I kept staring at him. And I was like, that man is living determination and somewhat of a, um, a message to me that here you are, you have more, and you have not done this. But this man wanted a book and he didn't let that stop him. And I, I met other poets too, which just basically one guy, he just hand wrote his book and he reproduced that. And even today, I hear, well, I can't do this because artists and writers, I don't have an easel. Like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, all you need to you find abandoned chairs in the street. Or, but anything, just, I mean, but if you just have the desire to do something, you'll find a way to do it. We find a way to do it for other things. And that, that, that's, that's, what, that's what speaks to the, to the main thing. You gotta be a hustler. Yes. You know, yes. It, it doesn't matter about the political landscape, the economic landscape. No. It's, it's who you are and what you do. Yes. Right? And, and basically what we do here is we help you tell your story so that you can galvanize and inspire people, okay. not only in their lives, but you know, to support your work. Well, thank you. And this is a great way to start 2017. And let me note, um, Bill. Yes. You were the first person to interview me in my studio. Oh. My studio is my private space. And I said, I've had photos that I've shared, but I said, where am I going to set this up? And I was looking around. I said, in the studio. Well, how did, how did, how did, we, rate, how did we rate such priority treatment? <laughs> Well, when you meet people, whether in person or on the phone, you just connect and say, I feel the vibe, this person's good spirit, this person um, in terms of character and all. And um, I, if you walked in here, I would feel comfortable. And I have friends that say, I've never seen your studio. I say, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, it's nothing personal. It's just that. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's like it's not. You're not. You're not part of the club. Right. I mean, you can see the results, but it's not necessary for. And 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 I I I, I I'm going to become more open and. Um, because there have been people that will come to our house, and I'm like, yeah, that's where I worked back there, and I'll have it covered up. Because uh, now sometimes it's junky, so I will oh, not want to show it. But it, sure. it's a lot cleaner now. I've been doing this big uh, educational, I mean, uh, organizational plan because um, I need gotta, to have things. You got to be organized to be successful. Actually, that's true. I mean, because some people think as an artist, just willy nilly, just no. Know, you do have to be organized. So let me ask you this. This is a, we got to go to the next clip, but let me ask you this. Um, you know, and doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, they all have what they call professional um, improvement. All right. What, how do you improve yourself as a, as a, as a painter? What, what improvement courses do you take? I, I have, um, I've attended workshops on writing because uh, I volunteer with an organization and um, I did a internship way back in college and I wrote a, uh, well, it was a grant basically. It's the um, League for Women Voters. It was through the um, uh, Vanderbilt and what was that called? The Student Health Coalition, I believe. It was a fellowship. And I said, oh, I got to write a report and so forth. And um, we were, it was for community development for this organization to raise money and to have health screenings and things. And this is when I was still becoming a doctor. But as a writer, I was able to, to kind of write this grant. And the lady was telling me, well, yeah, it's, you, know, you did a good point because I had to gather all these statistics and we did a few interviews and the mission of the organization and put it all together in this report. They got the grant and they were excited. And so, even when I moved to Chicago to the, the city and all, there were workshops that were given in terms of um, how to prepare your art. Okay. Uh, I constantly spoke, just like Uncle Chuck, um, to older artists because I figured they've been out here a long time. They must know something. And at that time, what was very popular to do was an artist would paint a picture keep the original, exhibit the original, but sell prints at various festivals and so forth. Because um, Greg Spears was like a mentor to me in Chicago. And this brother had two rooms of just stacks and stacks of prints, beautiful prints. He, he painted a lot of Bronzeville nostalgic um, urban scenes. Okay. And, um, but he said, Prince Jones, that's where it's to go. If you sell the piece, it's gone. You're right, right. But, and, but, but what I'm asking you is like, okay, here you are, it's, it's 2017. Yes. A lot of artists, they go to paint workshops, they go to color workshops. It's like continuing education. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because our sponsor here mm -hmm. is the Academy of Composition. And okay. for those people who are looking to upgrade their skills, right. you want to consider it. The reason why is because even if you're an abstract artist or whatever, because look at Picasso. Mm -hmm. Picasso was a master composer. At 14, he did masterful work. Have you ever seen his painting, The, the, the Communion? Mm hmm Yes. That was at 14. That's 14 correct. years of, of age. But his composition skills were off the chart. Right. His, even his abstract works are composed. So what I'm saying to anyone listening, if you want to improve your, your quality of your work, start with the basic foundation. That's composition. Right. Da Vinci says, that that is so true. I'm right. going to parallel Da Vinci. He says, 80% of my work is composition and design. Oh, yeah. And I leave it to other people. All right? So that's, all, that's for the sponsor. Getting back to my man here, Henry L. Jones. How you doing, Henry? You back with us? Okay. Good, good, good. So listen, man, anything, we're going to sum up now. Anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? I can't think of anything else. I've enjoyed the interview. Um, I have some shows coming up that I'm working on, some and solo shows. Okay, why, why don't you tell us where they are and, you know, when can we, how can we hook you up? How can they contact you to find out? Um, let's see, what do I have? Well, um, in terms of art, 
the solo shows, <laughs> yeah, one is at a university, it's going to be next year. And I'm looking at the space, in fact, tomorrow um, and see everything. I've sent them a portfolio. Uh, constantly, I go between looking for something immediately and then long term. Because okay. That then I eventually pay catch up because people don't realize how long it takes to create. Like they go into a solo show and you have 42, 55 pieces, and that takes time. This is not something you can knock out over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. right. That's true. So you, you have to pace it out. You come up with a theme and so forth. So, um, but there are some um, group shows I'm looking into. Uh, the play will be out January the 28th. Okay. okay. Mont Haven House. It's part of a wonderful exhibit. Uh, it's in, comp in um, col collaboration with a show of the phenomenal Ted Jones, print phenomenal tent make uh, print maker. Um, and well, also, where's where's that located? Can you give Mont Haven is in uh, the Mont Haven Mansion is in um, Hendersonville, Tennessee, right outside Nashville. Okay. Is there a phone number or an address or anything? Oh my gosh, I feel unprepared. We're talking about being organized. That's okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't have that with me. That's and, okay. So they can, they can contact you yeah. vis a vis your Facebook or your website. Right. Or just look up Mount Haven um, because it's going to be on social media. Um, but the, um, there's also a series of um, photographers. That's going to be a first also at that gallery. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. black photographers. It's doing. This is going to run throughout the entire uh, month of February, opening right. January the twenty eighth throughout February. Very good. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for listening again to Art with Bill. Thank you. If you're a painter, sculptor, or candlestick maker, this is the place you need to be. Why? Because your collectors buy from people they know, and to help them know you, you have to tell your story. Later. Peace out.